what's up everybody this is carl back again for another comic book spoiler review and the next one i wanted to talk about is the uh uh mutant team x-force uh it's more like the strike force of the uh uh of the x-men where like x-factor well in this not the investigation one that, that I did review on up on my channel, which by the way, if you like this video, my videos that uh, 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 leave a like, check out the other videos that I've been uh, reviewing uh, with my other comic book reviews, my other movie reviews, TV show reviews, as well as my video game walkthroughs and reviews of the games that I played. Check them out up on the uh, uh, YouTube channel, youtube.com slash talking of Carl uh leave it like anyway uh originally x factor uh from uh its origins start off as like a government uh sanctioned agency uh splinter group for, from the x-men where well, the x-men was more like vigilante superheroes but kind of known but kind of not so they can have some like private time you know without being hounded or whatever like that or not like uh accosted by you know racist like groups like uh 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 striker or uh you know Baltimore trask or anything like that uh x force is like a just like a secret strike team, black ops type of splinter, splinter group from the X-Men. And typically they are led by Cable. And of course, just like with Avengers or X-Men, is all interchangeable uh, uh, teammates. But I wanted to go with, you know, like it says, the classical ones. Uh, plus, you know, since I did X Factor with more of the, I could have gone with like the the original team of uh, X Factor when I wanted to do my review on that, but I figured like I wanted the condensed one because the original stuff always seemed like like a whole long slew over you know darn near approaching two hundred issues, and I didn't have time to read all of it. I could have could have just down like a good chunk of it and to do a review with just a couple of arcs but uh i figured uh, i'll go with classic x-force uh and i also really dig the art because like i mentioned many times it's like growing up in the 90s into the early 2000s like comic book art around that time was kind of like my sweet spot of art that like i am really drawn to no pun intended i mean there's art in the modern times that i dig as well but it's just something uniquely special and innate that i really dig from that era of comics it's not even just with uh with x-men is like spider-man there's been a couple of uh art here and there that i really dug from like uh spider-man in the early 2000s and and like the uh, 90s uh same way with like fantastic four you know even a couple of dc stuff it's like you know the artists around the time like of course like just look up the freaking artists because they you know flip-flop from the artists in this little omnibus the guy going on here uh uh but it's just like artists of that era that matter of fact because you know, i
uh, Ian Churchill and uh, Salvador La Baraka, uh, Ernie George Jensen. Uh, those are three three guys that you know been like uh, doing the art for uh, classic uh, X Force here. So uh, yeah, I been like okay, yeah. Yeah, these guys know their freaking stuff. I love looking at that art. Like, I'll sing like that uh, 90s, early 2000s comic book art all day long. And like, you know when you see it, it's just me. But anyway, uh, Jeff Loeb, actually you, you would be familiar with Jeff Loeb because he also worked on uh, uh, Batman Long Halloween comic, uh, which I did a one of my earliest comic book reviews. I did uh, a review on that on the channel. It's not as polished as I like for it to be because I was still like early phase of doing comic book reviews for the channel, but it's one of my favorite Batman stories. Uh, so yeah, please check that out. But anyway, this is, you know, pretty much set not too long after uh, the whole ordeal with Bishop fixing the Age of Apocalypse timeline and get everything back the way it was. Because prior to that, we got things like uh, uh, Cable coming to like helping you know, uh, Xavier's team in like, uh, 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 in Israel dealing with, uh, Xavier's son Legion. While, you know, you know, the X Men back at home, you know, have a, you know, uh, you know, a captured saber tooth in the danger room, but he's, you know, docile. After Wolverine stuck a claw through his brain, which is the first time, you know, because many iterations of Wolverine has always been showing him threatening to shove a, a blade through somebody's brain. The only time he actually, you know, committed to that threat was with Sabretooth. I never knew what the issue was when he actually did that, but he jammed that sucker through the freaking brain. And of course he healed because the saber tooth got the same healing factor. But like, if you remember like Origin, Wolverine Origins movie, where Striker put like a animantium blood through his brain that of course healed but messed up his memories. Essentially, that's what happened with uh, saber tooth, where he jammed a blade through his brain so now it's like did something it healed but it did something where it's kind of kind of like neutralized the the more homicidal uh savage part of his uh brain so now he's like very meek and docile but people don't trust him especially with marine so after he did that Rex xavier kicked him out so he's been living on the grounds hiding away uh because he re well i don't want to say he kicked him out but he's just like you know wolverine doesn't like the fact that xavier is keeping this monster in the house knowing how horrific he is but x-men don't kill and wolverine disobeyed in order it, it, it's a whole uh it, it, it was like a big blow up so Wolverine is living out on the ground secretly just waiting for opportunity for you know separate to, to really mess up so you can just jump in if need be but you know it's a whole thing and and you know of course you see that the whole ordeal with uh 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 says they were son trying to go back in uh go back in time to kill 
Magneto before he becomes Magneto to uh in his warped mind thinking like oh, okay my father has a goal and it would have been achieved a long time ago if he hadn't spent too much time trying to fight off Magneto and his evil mutants to, uh, and and cause like you know the world to like further distrust mutants because Magneto and his team kept like you know you know causing issues that his father had to keep stopping what he's doing to go deal with but in the of course you see my review on that in the aftermath you know in trying to uh, stop him uh uh you know uh legion accidentally put a side blade through his own father's head by accident which kills him and completely warp to, uh, the past until bishop who manages to get st still linked into the new timeline uh by timing when we bs but then eventually we claimed all his you know like it took a time for him to like get his memories reset of what happened before and inform everybody okay this is not a proper timeline you know as wasn't supposed to die blah 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 so things eventually got reset now we're back to normal with not many people knowing what happened in the original timeline except for maybe like uh, a couple of interesting people that wasn't supposed to be in this timeline but are like dark beast shows up at one point because you know that leaves a whole thing since age of apocalypse up until arguably current day where you know dark beast pops in and out they deal with him he always looming in the background they deal with him but then like he, we don't see him for a while then like in current recent x-men comics like oh beast hasn't been acting like himself even though i think it's kind of like a writer's you know you know writing themselves out of a hole because they almost like even with colossus they kind of write them not like themselves and it wasn't planned don't get it twisted they have written these characters to be very unlikable and instead of long ago fixing it when they brought this new status quo with the X-Men uh, a few years ago, uh, instead of writing it as their classic cells and likable cells, you know, they, you know, they, they went into a weird direction with these two and maybe a couple others, but primarily Beast. And so now, because a lot of people complains, and also it's like, I guess they took some cues from people like, what well, just can't they make it this dark beast so that way we could just have our beast back and be normal and so so like now they're like, oh yeah, we're that was our plan all along and it's like clearly it was not. You, you written yourselves into the hole and now you got like yourself an out, which is whatever. But you shouldn't have done it in the first place. You had your out from the get go. But I don't know what it was a line of thinking. But the dark beast has always been some kind of thing. I'm not even sure why we still had this guy when we probably should have dealt with him many years ago uh, I don't know it's like uh, if you want to keep Dark Beast uh, since he's stuck in the correct timeline if you want to keep Dark Beast and once he's found out and he's not like a secret anymore pretty much not really much of a secret anymore um you could have just uh after like especially after the um onslaught situation where he's trying to work with onslaught you could have just like okay the jig is up now we know about dark beast you couldn't have him working with like dr doom or yeah myriad of other villains this entire time like after civil not civil war but like after like during the whole dark rain situation where Norman Osborn saved the world from you know by stopping like uh the scroll queen from you know during the whole like uh 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 the whole scroll impersonating people and taking over trying to take over and everything like that uh he started to run uh 
shield or you know we're just taking over like the leader of the avengers or starting his own new avengers group led by other like just you know secretly they're really villains but they're dressed up in like you know avengers type uniforms like doc and wolverine son is wolverine you got uh bullseye dressed up as hawkeye blah 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 uh you could have had dark beast on that team and he's and be like you know he's pretending to be the good beast but he's really dark beast and everybody's no you could have just left it like that and it's like okay he's just, just a thing now which is fine but don't continue on with this mysterious dark beast that's looming i'm done with that person anyway i'm just you know bringing up the speed anyway now that we're in like a proper timeline now we we'll continue on with like what what X Force is, is doing after the whole situation. So, uh, like I said, we also get Nate Gray, which is kind of like a, I guess, different timeline version of of uh, of Cable, or at least like a young version of Cable in a way. And he's plumbing into Earth because he got. Rejiggered out of the, you know, f you know, alternate timeline before it got completely like, just annihilated, essentially. Uh, well, not annihilated, but just like it, it ended badly for whoever is still on the planet with all the nuclear warheads being sent off, or whatever. And most people was dead, and others kind of got off, off world. But he somehow got, you know, pulled out of that timeline, and he's in the proper timeline. And this weird uh, uh, character, because I remember having a couple of these X Force comic books reading as a kid, so I remember a lot of these issues. Not every one, but now I got like a complete understanding of you know. From it's fun reading comic books in, in, in your older form. Now you can like, look it up and read a lot of stuff that you know you probably saw. Uh, certain issues sporadically but never really kept track of like that because you're this young kid you read what you could at the time that you got it uh so now you got a complete understanding of what transpired from start to finish anyway i remember this issue and it's, it's like weird flea looking kind of character but it's just drawn like he's looking like a freaking flea in this but there's the other issues that he's drawn just like some weird alien looking thing i don't know it's just they draw you know different artists draw them in, in different ways here he looks like some kind of weird flea that's why i was thought it's like what is this fly looking guy as a kid i was like looking like what's this fly looking guy but he's called blacksmith he's kind of like you know he works with cable as like a tech kind of guy uh a t tech surveillance type of dude i don't know uh but he's tied to cable's past slash future Kind of deal you know the cable from the future anyway uh i'm guessing at some point before the events of the age of apocalypse start kicking off cable and his team of x-force you know took over arcade's old uh hideout and converted into their new uh headquarters until eventually like arcade came back and started like oh y'all in my place get the heck out kind of situation it's like uh but here one x force we got of course cable we got uh warpath richter you remember those guys uh from my x uh, factor stuff uh or well warpath was you know one of the original, well, the second original X Men in my giant size X Men story. Uh, uh, we got Cannonball, Shatterstar, Siren, uh, and we got Boomer, but, oh, of course, Domino as well. But we got Boomer. And if you remember X Men Evolution, Boom Boom, I call her Boom Boom. I don't like Boomer. I don't know why. Is I got no r real reason, but it's like I, I like Boom Boom. It's like it's like just call it Boom Boom. It's like because I remember Boom, I like Boom Boom 
from X-Men Evolution. It's like, God, that, that character was like really interesting. And I like her attitude. And it's like very explosive kind of attitude. And of course, she had like a troubled background with her uh, crap father, which makes like a slight uh, uh, appearance here. Clearly, uh, that, that's always been a good thing where uh, uh, Boom Boom, uh, you know, had a crap father where I'm not sure in the comics where he actually uh, seems, I don't know, neglectful. Well, in the show, he was like a criminal essentially and wasn't uh, a good uh, uh, parental figure. But here it seems more like I don't know. He's just like a neglectful father. Just I don't know sure if he was actually abusive, but definitely wasn't like fit parent. But anyway, it is a little thing with like uh, Boom Boom, where uh, uh, with her and Sabretooth, we'll get into in a moment. But yeah. Trying to get this. Well, RK, you know, shows up on like Intercom or like Hologram or something like that. I guess he came back to his old hideout and notice is like, oh, uh, X Force is taking over my spot. I mean, RK is like, I think he's primarily an X Men villain, but from time to time, you see him dealing with other heroes like the Avengers. Uh, so I'm not sure if he's primarily an X-Men rogue party rogues gallery for the X-Men. Uh the first time I ever even heard of Arcade as a villain was in uh Marvel's X uh, no Marvel's Ultimate Alliance, the first one. Uh that was the first time I've seen Arcade in anything. Uh because he's pretty much like Marvel's version of Toy Man. Uh, a Toy Man being like a DC villain, or more specifically, a Superman, uh, part of Superman's Rose Gallery. Uh, so now, Arcade sets off all these different uh, crazy gadgets and gizmos uh, that causes like havoc and you know, like all these different, like, uh, yeah, their, their own danger was going haywire and trying to kill them. And the place is eventually going up in smoke. They all make it out. Uh, but while they're trying to pull themselves out of the rubble, Jean, uh, Jean Grey shows up to uh, get their assistance uh, uh, and bring them to the X Mansion. Uh, uh, yeah, the reason I'm thinking, like, you know. It's just like a reason to get the X uh, X Force into the X Mansion. I'm pretty sure. Uh, oh yeah, there is a reason because Professor Xavier kind of sends Cable on a particular mission that because they're a covert team. There's certain things that you know the X Men cannot do because they're like quote unquote public public. But uh, they need to get you know, uh, cable ship called the pack rat out of the rubble. So using both their, you know, psychic powers, they lift it up out of the ground because of course cable can't go full tilt with his powers. Otherwise his techno organic virus will overtake him. So he got to use his, uh, second abilities very sparingly because most of that is just being, uh, uh, most of the power is being like uh, keeping that virus in check. Even though you send this dude in the freaking future as a baby in hopes of finding like a cure, and the best you can do is teach him, you know, how to like use his power to keep that at bay. I think that kind of like okay, but there's been like instances in like uh. Like, I'm pretty sure during the House of M, Powers of, uh, no, House of M, Powers of X, House of X kind of situation, they 
you know, set like a proper timeline with the X Men, and of course, we know Cable to have like a cool, awesome metal arm, but th- there's been times where they kind of fix that where they, they he doesn't have that metal arm, but I guess certain people might complain because they like Cable to be they like old Cable, but not like still young, like early 40s cable i guess we had a proper balance of what some people like the cable to be but then with the house of x kind of stuff where you know we, you know we got like the best of both worlds you know you know uh we got bishop and yeah uh you know cable hanging out with x-men and uh but they're still relatively young uh but you know Somehow he said, like, I don't know. Once I get through the uh, House of X, Powers of X kind of thing, I, I can refresh my memory. But I'm pretty sure he still got that, that metal on for some explicable reason. But let's be honest, it's because people recognize cable like that. But, you know, at a certain point, we don't need that no more. We should, we want to see cable. He's very powerful, but he, he spent half of that power trying to contain that virus. Like honestly, that kind of st- that hindrance stripped away, so that way we can see a full powered uh, offspring of Cyclops and Jean Grey really go wreak some freaking havoc on enemies. Anyway, uh, but you know, Cable's dealing with some personal issues with his own son Tyler. If you remember the classic '90s X Men, he had this son which i only found out during my solo uh x uh solo cable uh story that i did review on where uh cable uh uh had like a son named tyler but it's not really his son it, it, he he married this girl who already had a baby and kind of raised him as his own kind of thing the mother makes like a brief appearance in this story so we'll get to that soon but of course tyler because i remember bringing this up to my cable story where tyler grows up to be uh this villain named genesis which i'm pretty sure i heard the name of but never really probably seen him in anything but it's like a personal v- enemy of cable same way like you know apocalypse is like mainly got like x-men villain he's kind of like a personal villain for cable as well uh but jean gray is trying to tell her son that you know you should talk to your father because he knows a thing or two about like responsibility and how to handle situations like this uh you can get your you know some advice from him and you know how to be a proper leader and all this stuff he's been through this stuff so you can um uh can gain something from his experience uh uh but uh you know he had to make a pit stop to this abandoned uh shipyard where he uh meets up with blacksmith when he feels like he he got some kind of alert that somebody was like uh snuck on board and essentially tried to get at blacksmith but i guess the systems uh you know the security systems like did their due diligence but obviously it turns you know tip suspects it's gotta be tyler you know attacking people that i know uh so uh there was some kind of security footage to confirm whether or not it's actually tyler but uh the audio feed you know isn't you know isn't giving like a clear picture so you know blacksmith is going to be working on that the so cable heads off to uh the x mansion while him and uh flex Xavier is talking trying to figure some stuff out uh, the X Force team is dealing with their own issues because there was like a situation with Sunspot, 
who I guess got I guess he's got like an upgrade in his powers and he kind of lost his mind for a brief period and called himself Rainfire or something like that. And next was had to deal with that, but now that issue was resolved. So now, you know, he's back to normal, but he got like a boost in power, which he's kind of like, you know, uh, is reveling in right now. Uh, but everybody seems to be a little, uh, weary of him giving him like a second you know you know looking at kind of side eye here and there except uh cannonball who's more like a forget forget kind of situation with him but everybody else seems like i don't know we dealt a lot with you and you tried to essentially i guess try to kill them or something because he lost his he lost control of his uh, uh mind a bit you know with his power up Whatever the situation was, I didn't read it, so I don't know the full story. But I'll get, I can glean from their discussion that you know he's kind of lost it a little bit. Uh, and you, here you go. You see, uh, Cable hanging out in the uh, danger room. Of course, the danger room can uh, stuff like holograms of whatever you want. So they give him like a little peaceful little storybook setting just to keep him content because they cannot they need to put him in like a prison but he doesn't necessarily need to be like a little cage it's going to be like a nice cage in a way it's kind of like a happy medium that professor xavier is uh doing because they want to keep a watchful eye of him especially because he's seemingly docile now but they worry that at some point he will uh turn savage again which he clearly does uh of course during this time where you know, cannibal at this point has been you know he's not that young whippersnapper anymore he's like kind of rolls up to the point where he's kind of like a, a not a facto leader but you know you know something that cable trusts at like a higher you know who earned his trust to get to kind of rolls to the ranks in a way where Siren, who's like the second in command of the X Force, even without her, Cannibal would essentially have been put in that place where trust in like a leadership role type of do. Because he, you know, you know, uh, I think was well, I don't say he started off in it as X Force member, but uh Cable decides to give his team new uh, outfits and gonna be going through some uh, intense training in order to get a handle on like Sunspot and his powers and teach him new moves and handling certain situations because they gotta be better. And of course, Richter, which uh, I guess it's always been like a thing where Richter has always been, I guess, bisexual because if you see, if you saw my review of X Factor Investigations, him and Shatterstar had a clear relationship, which I didn't think there was always been like a thing, because I seen Richter only here and there throughout comics, and never really pay attention to Richter nor Shatterstar. I heard their names, but I didn't really follow that closely to them. Looking at this was clearly in like the early 2000s uh, story, late 90s, where clearly they're like playing coy with it, where it's like, you know, like they got a close friendship, but clearly reading between the lines now as an adult, clearly these two had some type of uh, a relationship, close relationship. Because the way they speak can be, as a kid, might seem like. A close friendship as an adult you can read it between the lines uh which is subtle which i appreciate where in today's day and age i guess i guess during the nineties, we had the whole don't ask don't tell kind of thing uh but uh now this day and age is like you know whatever they're gay so what you know uh but 
Richter is kind of like, you know, uh, um, you know, getting kind of headache. We're dealing with he butt heads with Cable every once in a while, mostly because, as you will see in another, you know, issue, that uh, other uh, another Cable arch enemy Strife, which is kind of like a clone of Cable designed by Apocalypse. Uh, who's evil? Uh, killed. Uh, I think I mean, like a parent of Richter or something like that. So Richter, you know, he has like a, you know, he has issues he got to work through, mostly because of strife with with Cable having the same face as the guy who killed, you know, somebody close to him. He's having trouble like reconciling all of that stuff. It's a lot to take in. Eventually, he'll just end up taking like a, a vacation from the team and going back home at, at a certain point. So he's not here in the complete story. Uh, and then also, uh, Cannibal gets, uh, or he thinks he's being let go from the x but on the contrary, he kind of like graduated in a way to be, uh, a member of the X-Men which he's thrilled with and of course him and Boom Boom will have like a, some kind of relationship going on so she is aside for him but now they're on different teams so they're going to be on different missions so here uh, I really dig this art right here the most here we meet this woman uh, Renee McComb who is from Genosha. Now, this day and age, when we ask comic book fans about Genosha, the only thing that pops up primarily in their mind is like the Genosha being run by Magneto and like a, supposed to be like a mutant haven or like a sanctuary, you know, uh, uh, place or like a nation, a mutant nation of their own kind of situation. But prior to that, if you remember the 90s X-Men story where Jubilee and Gambit gets captured on Genosha, it was like a a place where the these secret government uh or like at least uh off the books government kind of thing, uh where a bunch of uh people that thinks like Henry Gyrick or something like that, uh Pretty much enslaved uh, mutants and having them toiling uh, uh, there, essentially, where they run experiments to keep them uh, essentially sterile so they can't repopulate, essentially, and keep them docile and working. Uh, pretty much like it's slaves. There's no, you know, no bear, not bearing the lead here. Uh, but now during some situation there was like an uprising and now there's like a this kind of civil war situation Renee is being uh, secretly sent on a plane don't know how she got because the Genosha is supposed to be somewhere uh, not too far away from Africa but I'm not sure like how do you get like a well clearly they gotta have a plane as an island so obviously you need to get off the island in order to go to the mainland so but it's like you know, thing airlines get during a civil war there's like airlines being completely cut off so nobody can have any way off especially if you're dealing with civil war and you got a mutant uprising the humans who's probably control like the way on and off the island you know monitor extremely uh all the exit points from the island to keep anybody coming off. But somehow she got off, but she's obviously being followed by two uh, people. Uh, Cause there's a few humans that was on Genosha who sides with the human, I mean, sides with the mutants, but uh, there's two, uh, you know, black suited dudes who who's on the other end other side of the whole civil war trying to regain control follows her because she doesn't want 
they don't want her getting word out of what happening there on the island. She's trying to reach out to Professor Xavier so she can get some help, essentially. So she obviously like, you know, uh, uh, fake some passports and stuff like that so she can make her way off. Here yet, you know, the moment where you like Richter and Shadow Star clearly like have some kind of thing going on. So uh Shadow Star is, you know, uh you know, helping Richter to the airport. And so I don't know why he bringing his swords with him all the way out. Of course he's gonna need them, but uh He's going through this whole baggage claim and all this other stuff. Like, clearly, you don't need to do that. You're not exactly going with him on the plane. So, it's causing this kind of like bickering with, you know, TSA with him because, you know, you can't bring swords on the airline. And mind you, this is way before uh, 9 11. So, uh, security uh, wasn't as tight as it is now. But, you know, Richter shake hands with Cable with some kind of mutual understanding despite, you know, their button heads. Uh, he goes off to go his, to his home country to meet up with his family and just trying to figure some things out because he needed like a break. But then there's like a, a scuffle going on because there's like protest, uh, mutant hating protesters on, in the airport. Trying to keep like you know anybody from Genosia coming into the uh, states or something like that. Of course, you know Domino and Cable is there as well. Uh, I forget the reason why they need to be there, but they're there. But then this whole big fight breaks out because the whole Macomb and those two uh, black suited dudes. Uh, Try to catch her, but a big, you know, thing breaks out. So they're trying to get everything under control. Shatterstar uh, gets, you know, shot at. He he's relatively fine. He is unconscious, but Cable, you know, in like a you straight up military man going to like, you know, like uh, on his guard takes out one of the uh, black suited dudes, saving one of the TSA guys who's given Shadowstar a hard time because he doesn't like mutants. But then he's kind of had like a wake up call when Cable jumped out of his way to save him. And it's like, whoa, wow, you, you really saved me, but, but like, but you, you're a mutant. Like, and Cable's like, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I saved you because clearly we're not all assholes. Uh, so they save Macomb. We don't see her ever again. Cable brings her up at one point because she says she was going to like uh, meet up with Xavier. Don't know why you didn't take her with you because you literally live on the X Men grounds right now. But uh, she walks off. I guess he got other you know situations to deal with. But she says she'll keep. She'll try to reach out to Xavier. But isn't that your main mission? Like the main point of you getting to the States to try to find him. It's a whole thing. We never see her again. Kale brings it up and she still has not contacted Xavier because he says like, I never heard from her. You know, uh, she never reached out to me. So that was suspicious. Clearly something went on. It's probably like a completely different issue. Uh, then back at the back at the home base, we got Taliban attacking Sabretooth and Boom Boom, who's trying to bring uh Sabretooth like a bowl of milk. And it's like, all right, before I really get into it, it's like, okay, I know he's docile. And Meek, and I know Sabretooth normally has some kind of cat-like kind of attitude to him, but you treat him like he's a literal animal, 
like a little cat you bring him a bowl of milk to lap up and it's like i never really got into that it's like you're, you're leaning into the whole cat theme way too much so she's treating him like a little personal pet project or something like that where she's like oh he's nice to me oh he's so he's he's so innocent like you know it's like she, she's played like an idiot here but clearly she has father issues so you know uh she feels like she needs to take care of him because you know she wasn't taken care of properly and so she got her own little you know daddy issues clearly. but she walks in sees the entire danger room uh uh station completely trash and caliban is in the danger room so that way nobody can get in I don't know how he got in not to trash the entire spot but whatever uh and beating up Sabretooth who's clearly not fighting back but Caliban hates Sabretooth because you know Caliban was part of the Morlocks and Sabretooth killed a lot of people that he knew so he's seeking his revenge on this guy I don't know why uh Xavier didn't lay out the freaking ground rules about what's going on with like hey we got just so you know we got saber tooth locked up in the danger room leave him be he's you know mentally he's kind of like you know like a little meat child so it's kind of like you know it's not really a threat but we keeping him under technically locking keys so leave him be uh while he's staying here don't know why he didn't set that rule so warning them of course caliban see this because caliban's not like an idiot but he's not smart either uh so he attacks saber to boomer is trying to blast through but it's kind of reinforced so she can't like you know use her power but the whole thing is about explosions and it's like what the hell uh but thanks to cable who shows up rejiggers the console so that way uh him and boomer uh gets let in and using his mental powers he gets inside Kaplan's mind and try to calm him down it's like yeah i know who, what he is i know what he's done but look at him he's clearly not fighting back and and this isn't justice you're beating a, a man who's you know not only defense it's like essentially beating up a guy who's already locked up and in handcuffs and it's like this it's not you, you know, you know, that's not how we do things. It's, it's not justice. So this, you know, Caliban, you know, stops and walks away. But he chastises uh, Boom Boom. It's like, look, and you, we know you've been sneaking, you know, in here trying to give this dude uh, uh, food and stuff uh, uh, by yourself. Don't do that crap again. Because... And clearly, like, you know, Cable's that kind of like an authority figure that probably every little girl probably needs, and, you know, Boom Boom's clearly, like, need that strong parental figure because clearly she never got that from her father. Uh, and it's like, you know, setting the rules and, like, hey, don't do that crap again because as docile as he seems, you can switch on a dime. Something can happen uh, when we least expect it, and he can lull you in a false sense of security. We do not want you in here with this guy. But Xavier sends a uh, cable on a uh, uh, spec ops mission, essentially. To this. Uh, Com station or watchtower or something uh in the uh frozen tundra somewhere i don't know which one uh russia i guess uh so uh they are going there to see like you know what's going on because like a 
seeming like a distress signal going on, or at least not distress signal, but it's like you have an, there's a research team of humans working with uh, Xavier in the, like you know, it's part of uh, who who uh, share the same mindset as Xavier with you know helping bridge the peace between humans and mutants and this station uh uh itself in a way to deal with that anyway he hasn't heard back from them in a while he sends cable and a couple of members of the x-force to go uh check it out so warpath caliban cable and sunspot go and they see the entire team is dead and uh uh Seemingly, it's this mutant called Mimic, who turns out to have a uh, immune ability to take on the powers of mutants who is close by him. And from the jump, he has the abilities of the original X Men team you know, Cyclops, Iceman, Beast, Angel, uh, Jean Grey. Uh, so, uh, that's why he like kind of I guess isolated or something essentially for some reason. But we got an interlude here with uh, Siren in like this not Ravencroft Institute, but this different other mental institution that is run by a person that as Avery knows this woman who uh, I guess started this place and that's why this institute is named after her. I forgot her doggo name. But seemingly she's like kind of bad news bears and locking up Siren into this institution, keeping her collar so she can't use her powers. So now she's thinking like, oh, this woman is crazy. Uh, and she's holding uh, these uh, uh, instant mutants here, probably running experiments, all this other stuff. So now she can't get word out. But she, you later see her headset on calling for cable because she's having her own little insecurities here where she's like i gotta be able to handle this myself i can't call cable to come rescue me because if i do then i kind of lose this i feel like i might lose respect as like co-leader if i can't handle things uh as like a leader should blah 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 it was a whole thing is stupid it's like you're in distress no shame call freaking for help from your leader uh uh but we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, I've always been confused about this. I looked it up before I wrapped up my um, uh, read through this uh, story. Because always, been, as a kid, I always was confused about like what happened with this whole situation. Anyway, uh, we'll get back to that in a minute. So now we see uh, some of the X-Force members dealing with uh, Mimic, who's been here this whole time and thinking like, Oh, it was Cable and his team who had something to do with the death of these people that, you know, he, I guess, Ming was with. So now this whole cliche superhero fight where it's like misunderstanding goes on. So Cable thinks Mimic is responsible, Mimic thinks they're responsible. But uh, it leads into this massive fight. Oh. Uh, and we get once again like some more interludes with what's going on at home with uh 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 boom boom with you know caring for saber because he clearly not listening to nobody and i pulled this slide up because i'm thinking to myself look you got literally lion king characters here clearly this yeah not iago uh right what's that bird that work with Mufasa. Uh, ah, crap. Blink on that. Uh, he, he's voiced by Rowan Atkinson, Mr. Bean himself. But, uh, crap. He want to call me Yaga, but it's not. That's Aladdin. Uh, uh, I'm blanking on his name, but you know what I'm talking about. The bird from the Lion King. And yeah, clearly Pumba and clearly Timon right there. And it's like back in the day, this is before Disney way before Disney acquired uh Marvel. Uh 
your niggas could like because back in the day you know a lot of uh comics can reference whatever they want to reference all day long without worrying about like uh uh you know legal issues with uh making references because it's not like exactly like you know because you see like uh the bird and pumbaa got different colored shades to them so they can like easily you know uh make the reference but easily not getting trouble legal trouble but still they can pretty must make play fast and loose they can make batman because like in x factor they make batman references in uh uh in uh in the x factor story that i was uh, reading last so back in the day it was like the wild wild west almost not completely they can just make references without getting into trouble with some other company nowadays they do, would not dare make a Bat- batman reference in a marvel comic uh but now they can pretty much make uh, Disney references and Star Wars references only in the Marvel comics. DC, there's been playing comics where they did some kind of Looney Tunes like uh, characters in like certain stories, uh, certain French stories with Batman. Like there was one where uh, I forgot what it was called. I didn't really care for it. I thought it was fine, but it's like not something I really wanted to read again. But the color day was like this little bar in Gotham with characters, like a human characters, clearly inspired exactly like uh, 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 Looney Tune characters. So it's like only they can do that stuff. There's no way in hell that Marvel can make. Uh, they might make Looney Tune worded references but they cannot actually have like you know something like this without being in trouble or even like even attempt to bridge that line uh you know just like you know at a certain point they make their little uh flag on the on their uh mark on their little territory here and anyway Clearly not listening to anybody who you know when they said like do not bother Sabretooth, but she just feels so bad from because it's like a uh, uh, Florence Nightingale kind of situation. Because uh, Killer's like see him like a pet, and she feels sorry for him, and she's and she says she's not naive, but you are. You're you're, you're an idiot little girl. I'm sorry, but you say you know, but you clearly don't. Cause like you can feel bad for him in your own way, but don't be stupid enough to be alone with this guy who can easily be playing plain pretend. Or you might be serious now, but you don't know when that will be corrected again. Cause he's a sadistic bastard and a manipulator. He can kill you given the freaking opportunity just to take you hostage and uh, and um, just to make his escape or something. Anything can happen. She's not listening. And one night, Wolverine he sneaks into the mansion. He could just do that because he's stealthy as hell. Sneaks into a room, and even he, like, he's warning her. Everybody's warning her, but she just refused to listen to nobody. And it's like, I was like, uh, uh, like, uh, Wolverine's like, do not get fooled by Sabretooth. He's dangerous. Do not be in, in, in the same room with this guy. She's like, I can handle myself. I don't need you or anybody else telling me what to do. Just like a petulant teenager. It, you know, like, young girls like that think they know the world and it's like, you know, want to be hard-headed despite everybody that mama wanted her to do the opposite. She's going to fight against tooth and nail because she thinks she knows better. Uh, and of course, after the uh, fight between... Uh, Sunspot and Mimic, where you know he gets you know chastised by Cable for uh, going against his orders, but you know because uh, he Cable did not want Sunspot given his power upgrade, uh, he doesn't want Mimic uh, mimicking that because it's already hard enough for them to deal with a guy who has the powers of the original five X Men. Uh, 
Uh, but, you know, in the event he takes on the powers of Sun Spy, that's going to be even tougher. And, but he's like, he, that's why he tells him to stand down, but he refuses to listen. He's like, no, I got, because Sun Spy feels like he got something to prove or something. But he yells at Sun Spy, it's like, look, when I give an order, trust and believe that I have a good reason to. So don't like go against my orders. Uh, but, you know, because the Sunspot power upgrade is too much for a mimic to try to take over. And so he ends up colliding, you know, the fight ends up colliding into their ship uh, and leaving like a massive crater in the ground. Caliban, who has the power to uh, sense other mutants, can't sense them anymore, so he might just disappear altogether. Never see Mimic again. Uh, so they go back home to report their findings to Xavier. And because the ship is so beat up, uh, it's hanging on by a thread and a prayer. But we get another interlude with um, uh, Siren who decides, okay, I can't call Cable. I can't even reach out. And with She jigger rigs like an old clock and some other tech stuff that she, you know, put together in order to send out some kind of signal. But uh, she sends out the signal to Deadpool because he's like covert enough uh, to uh, get inside and get her out. Uh, and I remember this, you know, little issue as well. Uh, and of course, briefly, you know, Siren and Devil had like a little thing going on. I think before this or after this? Well, no, I know it was after this, but before this, I'm not sure. I know they worked together. I'm pretty sure they might have like a thing. Uh, so that's why she ended up calling him because she knows him. Um... So they, you know, managed to, to fly the ship right into the baseball field of the X Men grounds. Uh, and so Cable tells him, "Okay, go see Hank McCoy at the med lab so he can check you out. I don't care what you feel fine. I want to make sure you guys are truly fine." And so now we see that. Uh, I looked this up because as a kid, I never knew what went on after this whole situation because we never come back to this situation again. Uh, it turns out that this woman that Xavier knows isn't actually evil. It's her mind is being taken over by this other psychic who's also manipulating this young kid. His name is Games Master or something like that. And so he messed with Cyrus' head. He sends her out to relay messages to Xavier like everything's fine so that way the X-Men don't interfere with what's going on and they capture Deadpool to try to run experiments on him I could have sworn that you know uh, is this like a different version because there's like a alternate not alternate story but it's, there's like a uh, not like a what if but like an elseworld story in a way where you know, the whole Deadpool kills the Marvel Universe storyline where Deadpool gets captured by this crazy, uh, he turns out to be a sort of super villain, but pretending to be some kind of a therapist in his mental institution, mess with Deadpool's mind, causing him to have another, you know, mental break. And then that's where he realized, oh, we're all in a comic book, really, and we're being manipulated by outside forces. So, we got, you know, we go through all this pain and everything like that. So I'm going to relieve of all of us of our pain by killing every Marvel hero and villain, you know, in the entire universe. So that way there's no story, and, but it, it doesn't work, whatever. I never really cared for that story. Never really read it. I know how it ends, but I never really fully read it because I don't like those kind of dark stories where like, your beloved character is getting murked left and right. I don't care for that. And realistically, I mean, Devil can probably kill a good chunk of Marvel characters, but all of them, 
uh holly and Allie, like you know touch a strange really not not even Deadpool's best days uh anyway uh i thought there was like you know uh something like this in the main timeline but it doesn't work out uh in the that therapist favor or whatever but no it's like a whole totally different thing so games master is a low level psychic himself and he's taking over this institute so he neutralized Deadpool and uh siren sends her out to relay a false message just to keep like xavier from getting suspicious but it doesn't last long uh i looked this up to see like what transpired after this situation uh siren you know i guess gets her memory back about what happened she gets uh i forgot who she gets somebody else to help her out she doesn't tell the entire team she gets somebody else to help her out to break in the institute to rescue Deadpool from this situation and stop, you know, uh, Games Master, and that was that. So I thought I'd bring it up so you'll know exactly what transpired after this whole ordeal. I always wanted to know myself, so now I know. So here she is, like, oh, oh, everything's all sunny and hunky dory and everything like that. Uh, so you know, nobody's known the wiser, at least for now. So. Once again, uh, Boom Boom goes to see uh, uh, Saber Shoe. This should have been her freaking red flag right then and there, where the guy, you know, seems like a little kitten. Uh, not like, you know, metaphorically, like literally acts like a freaking kitten. But now he can speak in sentences now, but more like a, you know, like a young a uh, child not like a but like a young kid it is where he's like you know he's not like you know it's like like i can speak now and everything like that uh but he's still like not threatening but clearly he has some kind of like okay um uh-uh. I, mean, I, I want like a different setting now i don't want this childlike little thing i want to be able to go outside so boom boom like you know we can't let you out but i can get you the next best thing so they switch the holograms instead of a forest you get like the grounds of the x master so he can still get what he wants but without being actually outside but then uh he sees like some kind of i guess a hallucination of uh of wolverine and he's like you know i, I don't want to see this no more because you know I guess subconsciously he has some kind of fear of Wolverine because they always had this whole endless fight with these two where they're not afraid of each other, but there's on a subconscious level that's always that looming, you know, uh, they see each other as like a looming evil that they, they constantly in battle with kind of situation. But this should have been uh, Boom Boom's red flag right here and there. It's like, if he's starting to speak again, what makes you think he won't get back to his normal Saber Tooth self? Uh, you should have been like stopping him right here and there. Like, oh boy. Okay. He's coming back step by step. Uh, Storm eventually uh, comes to talk with uh, Cable, who's Going to this whole meditation stance here uh, that he learned from some kind of Ascani type of religious, religious thing that is in the future. And it's the first time you actually see like, oh yeah, this whole techno organic virus is like not just his arm. It, 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 it's probably this entire, you know, left side of his body. Uh, which is, you know, kind of neat to know. So he has a little one on one conversation with Aurora, and he mentions that he got this postcard uh, uh, that's not signed, but it's addressed to Nathan Dayspring, which is his name, because people just normally call him by Nathan Summers, because he's the son of Gina Scott, but mostly by cable. 
Not many know the name of Dayspring, except for a very select few. And he suspects that Tyler taunting him. So she suggests that she come speak with uh, Xavier about this kind of stuff to get some kind of clarity. So you see this kind of, this postcard kind of looks like a freaking um, hostage note or something. And this is also where, uh, and I love this art. Like I said, I love this freaking art. This is also where uh, Nathan brings up about, like, did that Macomb girl reach out to you? Like, you haven't reached out to me yet. Like I said, never heard from that girl, for, at least in, not in this uh, run. Probably in, like a different X-Men story that happens after this. So, uh, in case you're wondering where Domino is, well, Domino uh, jettisons off after the whole ordeal with the airport. She watched on the news uh, about this, uh, some weird, like, Sasquatch type of guy in the Rocky Mountains. And she suspects who it is, given, like, a distinct footprint that they found. So, she suspects as uh, old X Force teammate of, uh, or at least whole comrade between her cable and this thing, and she goes to this old uh, shack and finds this guy who turns out to be this uh, character called the Grizzly, who uh, has I guess gone bestial and killing a bunch of. Uh, people in the surrounding area so trying to being old friends she's trying to see if she can do anything about it but uh, uh, it, it wasn't a very interesting uh, little side story at all personally but I do appreciate the art because here uh, when they start this little interlude thing this art immediately because I because it's Jeff Lowe it's like I immediately like got like oh my god this is like because the art the same artist I said Jeff Lowe but like I, I the artist that was doing this particular issue I immediately start thinking about Long Halloween because it's the same kind of art style uh, it's like one for one with like the shadow work and everything like that is like oh my god it just brought up memories uh. But the story was like wasn't particularly interesting. She ends up having to kill this guy, uh, so uh, I'm not going to really get back into it. So Cable goes to meet back up with Blacksmith, hoping that he has like a clear picture. He doesn't really, but he suspects like it's got to be tough. It's the only explanation. Uh. Uh. Then. Blacksmith uh, starts speaking, I don't know, psychically, mystically, I don't know, to this woman named Rachel Summers, the daughter of Jean and Scott from Ultimate Timeline, which, and, uh, was it X Factor? Or something else. I'm pretty sure it was X Factor. Where it's like, well, X Factor has like a, X Men do a lot of different timeline BS. You know, mainly, in the main timeline, they have a son. Ultimate timelines, uh, there's like a daughter named Rachel Summers, which I think is in the main, you know, X Men canon now. Uh, I'm not sure, but here Blacksmith is speaking with like an older version of Rachel Summers, and it's like, oh, like you know, prepare Nathan is like a, you know, something important he will have to deal with. Uh, uh, but he's not ready yet, blah, blah, blah. You know, time will tell, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so let's uh, move on to the... There are two... Uh... Uh, different uh, slide reels. 
Uh, so here, uh, like I said, like, you know, Domino's done with the grizzly. She has to kill him. Not really particularly interesting. But Cable ends up finding his seemingly alive wife from the future in the past. And he's confused because uh, she's, you know, she time traveled from the future to find this, uh, I guess this, in her point of view, this mysterious uh, leader named Cable. But here's the thing, because it's kind of complicated time travel as always is. She's from the future, but not the particular future that Cable's from, because in Cable's future, this woman is supposed to be dead. It's supposed to be like the mother of Tyler, the future mother of Tyler. But she's still relatively young, which means she would be around the same age as Nathan would be when he was young in the future. See, time travel at a particular point in the future, back in time, try to find this cable person. She doesn't know that Nathan will become the future cable from her from her future point. Uh, so she thinks cable is this mysterious figure that oh she got to find as like a uh, uh, this awesome military leader from the past or, or something or other. She got to find this mysterious cable. She goes back in time. Uh, of course, Cable's conflicted. It's like, oh my god! It's like this is uh, Alila. I think that's what he called her. And it's like can't tell her everything because that might ruin her future. So I gotta play pretend like I'm a separate person from my younger self. So she uh, tells her. Uh, she tells him that there's a situation in the future where. Uh, a uh, comrade of her named Nathan has been hit by, we, we get attacked by this guy named Strife in the future who is uh, decimating our forces, neutralize our, uh, 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 my comrade Nathan, and they have this kind of uh, particular uh, MacGuffin, uh, gourd, glowy thing uh, uh, that is in his uh, possession. We need your help to revive our uh, uh, fallen friend who's important for the safety of the future or of our future for the future whatever so uh, uh, blacksmith sends uh, using like I don't know if he got some kind of power or just a combination of tech or something to send him to her timeline, particular point in the future, not too long in the future because she wouldn't be alive, uh, where as Cable would know it. So it's also Blacksmith also sends Domino, who's always in the Rocky Mountains, bearing a friend of hers, sends them all in this particular point in the future uh, because of, of uh, Rachel Summer's little you know, plan in order to, you know, set certain things in motion for the benefit of Nathan, whoever that might be. So now the end of future of at least to the point where uh, she uh, uh, supposed to be. And they meet up with Domino and they got to uh, quietly navigate through this forest because is a territory run by strife and he has his forces monitoring every little which way and of course domino is kind of surprised and she speaks psychically to nathan's like ain't this your wife like in the future it's like yeah but keep down on D dl because can't mess up the timeline by informing her of future her future events and what will transpire uh so they eventually sneak on, uh, they have to uh, uh, sneak past, they get, they steal some cloaks from 
of a fallen enemy so that way they can uh sneak through the campsite in order to get to the other side to meet up with their people which they do and like this art is amazing i love this freaking art it's like not like super realism but close enough where it's like okay we take out jaw lines and the the way hair flows i love the way hair flows in uh in the 90s and the early 2000s i think in recent years in terms of like hair movement that i really love is electra in recent uh daredevil comics where her hair is almost seemingly all over the freaking place and i like it it's like i really like just just the crazy flowy type of hair it just shows our, our artists can really show movement with hair even if it's like a still image you can still get that flowy kind of look to it and i love that i really love that and not many people do that nowadays i don't know who was the artist for like uh the daredevil stuff in recent years where the way they drawing like uh electra but that's like for, for uh, just off the top of my head he's the only one that's doing like very dynamic hair movement in in, in their in their art so you see like a young strife like i said clone of uh able really evil as hell uh and he's torturing a member, a captured member of a Cable's, a young Cable's team to try to gain information. But here you see Cable looking, he's, it's a surreal moment. And normally in time stuff, I mean, like time is going to be finicky because I remember this movie Time Cop where it's like, well, not necessarily Time Cop, uh what was it you know there's other time movies where it's like you can't look upon your self from like your present self goes back in time look at yourself from uh in, in the past it will cause like some kind of like mess a uh, 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 mess with the space-time continuum kind of situation but in most other cases like oh you can Look upon yourself and be perfectly fine, but uh, it's just. But even with Doc Brown says like, you know, could be nothing, or you could, you know, cause like a imposing of the space time continuum. It's fifty fifty. You don't know. That's just guesswork. But uh, right now, Cable's having like a surreal moment where it's like he's looking at a young version of himself who's uh, lying, I guess, in a coma thanks to uh, some kind of situation with like a fight with strife and slowly dying and the only way to save him is getting this little gourd green gourd that is in possession of the stripes having his possession which is kind of like a uh, it speaks I guess seemingly like in the tone of Professor Xavier but, but it behaves like you know he always had this kind of time device where it's like he can body slide is pretty much like a teleport but he, he can teleport but it's also like a time time travel device it's like body sl when you see it here cable say the words like body slide by one which is like teleport by one kind of thing that's how the gore pretty much behaves in a way where it's kind of functions like that uh but it's like okay in order to help nathan I gotta get this thing. So Domino slips off because she knows how dangerous stuff will be in the future and detriment to Cable in the long run. So she feels like, okay, K uh, won't do the deeds. So I'm gonna do it for him because she's clearly in love with, they clearly in love with each other, but not fully expressing that because they're like stoic type of characters. But Nathan had to stop her with, with lets off a, a blaster in the air which causes uh, the enemy to be alerted but cable doesn't want anything to happen to strife in this current time because like it'll ruin it might ruin certain things in the timeline that needs to be able to happen uh no matter the quote-unquote good intentions so 
uh they sneak in the campsite and one of the other uh supposedly the uh teammates of alila then corliss turns out to be working for strife and of course domino cable uh, gets the gourd and gets the hostage body slides out of there uh and of course strife shows up thing like oh you betrayed me so he ends up killing killing this guy uh but now that they got this little thing they help uh young nathan who uh is feeling better but then the uh this timeline's blacksmith who clearly understands what's going on sends them back to their uh back to the past but not to the x-men grounds it's uh there's some kind of interference from this mysterious foe which we'll get into who doesn't send them back to the grounds of the x-men it sends them to genosha uh Uh, it, it sends them to, to Genosha, which we wrapping up that little bit of story. But um, we get a little snippet of an epilogue, not necessarily like a full epilogue, but it's like a one single panel showing that oh, things will go how they're going to go for this future, where Cable will continue fighting along Strife, and eventually Alila will birth a child. Which will be Tyler and Nathan will eventually turn into Cable in the future. So take on the name Cable in the future. At some point, I'm not sure how familiar it will be or if she will catch on that Alila like will eventually will realize, oh, I teamed up with my future husband. Uh but I don't know, she might have died before he took on the name Cable, so she will never know. I don't know. I'm just speculating on that part. It could have, like, it's been years, so it could have, like, you know, switched up that story to make it make sense, or like, you know, retcon that a bit. I don't know. But we got a little interlude with the X-Force, I mean, like, well, X-Force and slash X-Men, where they have an intervention with Boom Boom, because despite everybody Individually keep telling her to stop going to see Sabretooth She refused to so she decides okay Clearly there's something going on with you You can't not go down there. We're ordering you not to we're ordering you. We're begging you We're beseeching you every which way possible to not go in there With this guy again But she is like oh and she decides to throw it in everybody's face like Oh, we all had done bad before, but we never gave up on each other. Everybody deserves a second chance. Why can't we? We're, we're, we're supposed to believe in second chances. We're supposed to uh, be better and all this other stuff. Uh, that doesn't really count. I mean, I understand where she comes from. Uh, you can say it's like a young, naive girl, but th that will be the hope. But also at the same time, don't be stupid. It's like, you know, because Sabretooth, characters like Sabretooth, Carnage, Joker, those are the kind of people that, yeah, they're, those are the prime examples of people that, yeah, that's just who they are. There's no redemption status. They might have, like, the few sporadic moments of good they might have done, but by and large, they're vile human beings. And she's that try to throw it in everybody's face about like, oh, sounds by you used to be like rainfire and you did all this horrible stuff, but we gave you a second chance, blah blah blah. And it's like, you know, and Cannonball, her boyfriend, trying to explain to her, like, no, you're you're trying to, you know, change the subject. You're trying to like, you know, I'm like, why are you going out your way to try to cause clearly you got daddy issues. Clearly, you're trying to like fix him because you want to fix your father, pretty much. But uh, 
they have to sit her down and explain to her, hey, this isn't about uh, Sunfire. This isn't about any of our uh, issues. We're talking about you and the current situation at hand. You're trying to every which way to try to make it okay for you to go down there and see this dude. And we're trying to explain to you, he's going to end your life. And none of us will be around to stop it. We're trying to help you. So we see the writings on the wall and you're not. And here, I think it's like, she's trying to do like a compromise, which I think would have been fair in a way where she's like, okay, how can, can I see him with a chaperone? Anyone y'all can like take turns like chaperoning me when we go down there. And they said like, no, absolutely not. So she kind of like, you know, you know, you know, ultimately surrenders to the situation in like a tearful way and everything like that. But and so I'm thinking to myself as I'm reading this, like, okay, yeah, that would be a heavy compromise because clearly she wants to help this guy. She believes in second chances, but you could just take the precautions like, okay, you know, y'all guys can take turns in shifts walking her to uh uh make sure you know saber tooth is uh you know while she's like trying to take care of saber tooth and everything like that and feed him because you do have to feed the guy because you can't not like he's going to starve to death but also you want to make sure he doesn't starve not to death but he still needs to eat and drink so clearly you, you send somebody to give him something uh so it could be her, but you know, any one of you can monitor the situation, make sure like, okay, uh, you can spend like uh, 10, 20 minutes at a time talking with him while you're feeding him and everything like that, while we're, you know, you know supervising the situation. That seems like a fair compromise, but they're not relenting on things on their end, which I think that is like the only issue I have with them where it's like you're not willing to compromise where it's like you know any one of y'all can well uh, any one of y'all can like along with boom boom can in case something happens y'all can easily fight them off it'll be two on one or three on one at any given time uh uh of course there's security cameras and blah 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 so and y'all got like distress beacons on your costumes that you can press at any moment of time so you can get some help. Uh, but they're not relenting. And so that's the end of that little juncture. But I thought that, you know, that, that's the only kind of interlude that I was a little more interested in because clearly, time and time again, you see this girl trying to help out Sabretooth. But she got naive to think that she can fix the guy. And she... It's one of those things where, you know, certain girls want to fix, like, you know, you know, she thinks she can fix the, the bad boy. Then you see, uh, we're back on Genosha where you meet up with this guy named Philip and his uh, girlfriend, who's like a mutant. And Philip is the son of the uh, Genosian scientist who created this uh, mechanism to sterilize. Uh, mutants to make them docile and be a part of the slave labor force on this thing but their inside guy who tends to be sinister clearly who's been like feeding them information and uh because he's like a mad scientist in himself but he was the one responsible for messing with the teleportation thing somehow not, not sure how he knew that uh cable and uh domino was going to be transported from the future to the back into the present but somehow he figured it out and teleported them to uh genosian grounds that's where they bump into uh, uh these two couples and then they're dealing with like you know the ultimate like threat here will be the sugar man who's like an alien in a way who's uh uh comes from the same 
dimension or world or whatever uh, as a uh, shadow star and um long shot uh, maybe not long shot I- i'm not sure if long shot uh but clearly it's like uh definitely shadow star so he's the he's obsessed with like nate gray and by extension i guess cable as well uh so he's on some kind of secret base on Genosha uh, himself. So Philip uh, and his girlfriend keep blanking on her dog on name. Uh, uh, you know, you know they're, you know they got their little uh, uh, little group of not refugees, but essentially former. Uh, Slaves of you know, mutant slaves and a few hotspots of humans that sympathize with the situation that defected from like the upper echelon of the uh, people of Genosha who was running things. So uh, they figure, oh, Cable can help us fight back and deal with like the magistrate who are the upper echelon people on the other end of the civil war. Uh, but here come these group of magistrates. Uh, uh, so they found the little hideaway. Uh, a fight ensues, but it's only like four of them, four of them against like a bunch of other people who can easily fight back. But I guess they got the hardware to like compensate for that. But still, it seems like uh, woefully outnumbered. Especially with like Domino and Cable into the mix. So they end up fighting them off. There's this guy on the magistrate called Pipeline who has this tech that can teleport uh, him anywhere he needs to be and a group of people. Um, at least a certain group of people. Uh, uh, so while he's t- teleporting his teammates out of the fray cable gets a hold of this dude incapacitates him so that way they can gain information so like the whole thing is like a awesome display here it's like god it's like the dynamic of the art like i i cannot rave about the art more so than i already am uh so a fight ensues not sure why you don't see you see other people you assume there are also other mutants, but I don't know why they can't just help with fighting back because you clearly would have powers. Some might be useful, some might not, but still, some level of like help. Because it's only seen like Philip and his girlfriend and Cable and Domino, the only people that actually put up a fight. Weird. So, getting inside, you know, uh, his mind, they realize. Uh, there's this like a uh, abandoned facility on the outskirts of Genosha that shouldn't, well, the magistrate wasn't allowed to go there, but clearly there's something up because they're trying to shut down this uh this uh machine that's keeping you know like it's making people docile and sterile and all this stuff. They gotta shut it all down. Uh, that Phil's father helped orchestrate. Phil's father's dead now, but you know, Philip is, you know, feeling like, okay, I'm partially responsible because, you know, I let this, you know, he blames himself for allowing this to continue without properly fighting back from the jump, whatever. Uh, so, this also was, you know, something that Sinister was uh, using secretly, but the Sugar Man pretty much took over uh so well there's still people here they they escape and now it's just like uh these group of people up against the sugar man and sugar man you know started this countdown where it's kind of like a nuclear warhead type of situation i'm not sure it's like nuclear it might said it was nuclear but it might have like you know take out this entire facility so as the timeline is time going down 
despite Domino, uh, despite Cable's protest, Domino sticks by him, and uh, Cable convinces uh, Philip to, uh, you know, teleport him and uh, the girlfriend out of there because uh, uh, Sugar Man and Philip went toe to toe against each other. He ends up, you know, grabbing hold of uh, Philip, and they end up blinking out of there, teleporting somewhere. Doesn't really matter. Didn't really care about this whole subplot in all actuality, personally. But she's freaking out, thinking like, "Oh, something's going on." But Pipeline is having like this new perspective because, like, something positive mutant has been running things here, and we've been played. You know, the magistrate has been played by fools, so. They pop in to the magistrate headquarters and he's telling everybody to stand down. We all been played as fools. So clearly there's been, there's going to be some kind of change with Genosha, whatever. doesn't really matter. So now, uh, uh, Cable's trying to figure out how to shut this thing down. And it's kind of a funny moment where, and here's, here's the thing where it's like, okay, like that was like, Teleport out by this uh, sugar man, and uh, cables like okay. I don't know this guy's password. I tried to go inside his mind, and I'm getting this jumbled mess. But then he has some kind of epiphany. Like it couldn't be that easy. It couldn't be. It's so stupid. And because he saw in his mind all of these desserts, and he type in the numerical password sugar. Because in his mind, it's filled with a lot of like, you know, pastries and all this other stuff, sugar related content. And it's like, he's obsessed with sugar. And he's like, oh my God, this is so stupid. It's kind of reminds me of Spaceballs joke, one of my favorite jokes in the entire uh, film. And it's like, the password is one, two, three, four, five. That's the stupidest password I've ever heard in my life. It's like, it's like, oh my God, this is the dumbest password. <laughs> And of course it works and the bomb doesn't go off. The sinister sinister shows up and explains the cable that uh before he sends him back to the X Mansion with Domino, where it's like uh is it's basically foreshadowing this more uh that you don't know uh you know, mentioning about you know subtly mentioning about Nick Ray, all this other stuff. It's you know uh, uh, this is pretty much foreshadowing other future events, but this is pretty much the end of this X Force classic. Uh, it's it's fun. I wanted to like something relatively short, but also in the vein of like late nineties, early two thousands kind of stories with uh, X Force, because I miss that you know time period of that kind of stage of comics. Uh, but yeah, that is pretty much. X Force, classic X Force. Um, it's fun. I'm like you know, like every once in a while, I really like revisiting like that earlier period of comics. That is such. That's just my era of comics. Honestly, personally, I like certain you know, you know, comics of the modern age, sure. But you know, I don't know. I grew up on a particular you know comics, and it's just like just fun. It just seemed like fun adventures without BS events, you know? Because I don't recall, like, I haven't read much comics as a kid, but because I wasn't following like that, I just read what I could at the time. But it just, unlike this, in the past couple of decades, we wasn't inundated with events after events. It's it just like, even with Marvel and DC, where it's like, we're just, you know, so many events and bigger stories. It's like, just want fun adventures every once in a while. Just like, you know, one-off stories. Uh, it doesn't have to be like world ending bull crap or multiverse level crap. It's fun every once in a while. But it's just like, you know, honestly, just Spider-Man stopping you know, Mysterio in this one-off adventure kind of thing. Uh, I want this X-Force dealing with like some weird stuff that's happening on Genosha in one adventure. 
uh you know there's one captain america dealing with some uh one-off adventure with uh crossbones or something so it doesn't need to be like this big catastrophe kind of situation uh i think most people would be in agreement that is just fun comics i don't know force uh you know uh agendas but i need force like events that's gotta be world ending all the time they're just like simple adventures simple stories and every i think like we want more of that and less of events because events supposed to be special and they're not as special as they used to be it seems like it's more mandated now from on high and it's kind of annoying uh my personal opinion uh anyway i will see you guys uh uh later i got this you know kind of discussion video i really wanted to talk about uh but i will leave that surprise for now but uh like and subscribe uh share this with your friends let me know what you guys think of the x-force you know comics do you have a favorite x-force story uh who's your favorite x-force member and um the next comic book review will be back to dc i'm gonna be going through a lot of su superman related content in terms of reviews uh in april hopefully that you know that's the plan but i got this whole jury duty standby letter thing where it's like i'm i might not get picked uh so i might have you know the time to actually do my reviews as planned cross my fingers but uh that's the plan but anyway i will see you guys soon take care have a great day peace